Well, welcome back to our second chapel service time and time in the Word of God. And we had a great morning with uh, Pastor Haney and looking at the Luke 18 text. What a great text that is. Hopefully that is an encouragement to you with regard to just the discipline of prayer. And I think if you could just keep prayer as conversation, keep that mindset. My prayer life is really my time to just talk with the Lord and to unburden my heart, to lift my spirit up to Him in praise, to express to Him all of the things I'm depending upon uh, from Him and to give Him glory in that way. I think that perhaps some of that takes away the the, you know, I think the deadness that sometimes can settle into our prayer life because we think of it in such uh, rigid terms. But think of it as it's a part of my relationship with Christ. That's how it, it flows and that's how it works out. We do have uh, one guest on campus. I don't know if uh, Josh is in here. Josh Zavlowski, did he come over? But uh, he's over in Cathcart. He's with uh, UW Sports Ministries, and he is a graduate of the college back in 1999. So you might want to talk with him about some of the opportunities that would be afforded to you if you were going to be doing some sports ministry kind of outreach during the summer months. And that's Colorado, and I think he said you travel to about 30 states. So that'd be kind of a fun way to spend your summer. And all you need is about $450 up front to uh, be part of that. So, well, we don't want to take any more time from Pastor Haney, but he did serve us well and minister the Word of God to us in such an encouraging and challenging way. So Pastor Haney, you come and minister to us one more time. Please turn your Bibles to Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1. Give me a minute to turn and then we will look to our God. Let's pray together. Father, it is going to be a glorious day. We're looking forward to it. We know it's for sure. You will come back. You will set up your kingdom. Lord, while we wait, help us to seek you. We just gave lip service to a song that said that we were desperate for you. I know in, in all honesty, it's hard to even sing those words because so many times it's not the reality of our lives. But Lord, our desire is for the gospel to elevate our thoughts about you and your redemptive work. Lord, we're thankful for it. We're thankful that we have life in you. And so, Lord, would you please encourage us to long for you more because we have been given so much in Jesus Christ. Lord, help us in this time to understand this particular text in Philippians in your name. Amen. Philippians 1 there, we are going to kind of move toward the perspective of how do we pray. This morning tried to present to you a case of why we pray, and that is because God has instructed us to pray while we wait for Him. That's part of the Christian's life. While we pray, while we wait, we must pray. And so this particular session, I want to help us then look to the Word of God and let the Word of God instruct us on how we should pray. I would like for you to kind of think about some of those times that you've had to be with God's people in a prayer setting. I'm sure many of you grew up going to some kind of a church where people probably got together from time to time and prayed, whether it would be on Wednesday nights or in other times, small groups, things like that, where people prayed together. And when requests were given, I want you to think about what requests were given in that context. Maybe it was in a youth setting and you had regular times in a youth group where you could pray together and someone would ask for prayer requests. Maybe it was a Sunday night fellowship after the church. The youth would get together and they would sing and then take time to pray. Or maybe it was in a youth meeting on a certain night of the week. But there was that occasion where people could give prayer requests. And I want you to think about the majority of prayer requests that you remember. Now, even currently in your life, whether it's in a local church setting or maybe in your dorm setting, maybe in your groups on campus when you meet from time to time with different groups on campus, and there are prayer requests that are given, I want you to think about the content of those prayer requests. Most of the time, 
what comes to the surface in those kinds of settings. When God's people get together and they are going to pray together, the requests that come to the surface are things like, please pray as there is a project due or a special work assignment that is, is, is coming up and, and someone needs help for that. Many times it's a relative who has surgery around the corner or maybe someone who is struggling with cancer. Sometimes it's this person needs a job or there's a financial need. Maybe it's a request of someone that needs to be saved. There's a, there's a relative, maybe a parent or an aunt and uncle, someone who is, is close to someone in that group that is, is coming together to pray. And, and the request is, pray for so-and-so, they need to come to know the Lord. That is typically what you find when Christians come together to pray. And normally when we give requests, our first reaction is me. Right? I, I need prayer for me. And it's in the area of something in the physical realm. Whether my health or my project or my finances. Normally that's where we start and that's what surfaces in a prayer meeting. Now, does God care about all those things? Absolutely. So I am not saying that those requests should not be made known and those requests should not be prayed for. That's not my point. But rare is the occasion when God's people get together and what surfaces are requests that deal with the spiritual life of those people who are present or the spiritual life of those in another area that someone has mentioned. That is, that is fairly rare. And I was given a book called A Call to Spiritual Reformation 15 years ago by one of my mentors. And that book revolutionized my, my prayer life. It helped me to think deeper in regards to the prayer request that I think God desires me to pray to Him and when I have the opportunity to lead a prayer meeting. And what that book does is it goes through all of Paul's prayers that he prayed for the churches that he had ministered to or was closely connected to. And it shows what Paul actually spent concentrating on when it came to prayer. And rare in the scripture do you find what we find as the majority of content in our prayer meetings that take place in the American Christian culture that we live in. So what I'd like to do today is, is kind of help us look to the gospel and allow gospel priorities to elevate the content of our prayer. I'm not saying you should not pray for the project that's due here in your school semester, that you should not pray that your financial bill is met, that you that should not pray for that person who does have cancer that you're close to and, and ask God to heal. I, I'm not saying that at all, but I do think we can all grow in the content of our prayer requests. And wouldn't it be great is, if we would take prayers like this and actually apply them to our regular discipline of prayer because there, there are many of them in the epistles. We have all kinds of examples to look to that, re, that really help us understand the spiritual nature of praying that I think God has for us. And Philippians chapter 1 is one of those prayers. I was recently uh, encouraged to help my children along these lines. I started to notice a pattern at, at dinner time when we would get together. I have four young children and I would notice a pattern. I would ask if there was anyone who wants to pray and, and it, what would quickly be the regular routine was something that I, I actually mentioned a couple times in the session this morning. What I would hear is, Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this food. Thank you for this day. Please be with us. In your name, amen. I, I could pretty much, I can bank on it. I can count on it. And what I thought I needed to do is help instruct my children about prayer. And I love what Dr. Clem said at the beginning of this. 
And that's how I approached my children. I said, you know what? Prayer is a conversation. If you were friends with someone or you were in a close relationship with someone and every time they came to talk to you, they said three phrases, would that not be extremely awkward? Okay? So you're trying to build a relationship with someone and you have contact, the contact is there, and they say, thank you for this food, thank you for this day, please help me or be with me, amen. That's not a relationship. That's not a conversation. That's routine words, basically, phrases. And I wonder how many times we get into just these routines if we even pray. That's the big question. Do we pray? And if we even pray, what comes out in our prayers? Is it very me-centered? Or is it gospel-centered? And as we see the gospel and how God wants to apply the gospel to our lives, it then moves as we pray for others in a gospel kind of way. And I love the theme for this year. Love the gospel, live it, and proclaim it. And I think in this particular passage, you see those three ideas. There's a love for the gospel, and then there's this living of the gospel, and it's, and it's wrapped up in Paul's prayer. So let's look there in chapter 1 and verse 3, because we see here, I think, in the first section... Just this thankfulness for the gospel, this loving the gospel in this first part of the text. It says there, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you. So there is, there is a going to God and there is a thankfulness that characterizes Paul's prayer first and foremost. So when he goes to pray, it normally is filled with thanksgiving first. And, and I think as well as you look at the rest of scripture, Praise should be part of that. You know, in the scripture, you look at all the commands that God has given his people, and the one that shows up more than any other command is to praise. I love that. God desires for us to praise him. And so when I, when I begin my prayers, it's, it's always I go to the attributes of God, and I start with that. God, this is who you are. You have revealed yourself in the word. You're all-knowing. You're all-powerful. You're all-present. You're sovereign. And I just work through who he is. That's where I start. And then I move towards thankfulness. Because Jesus Christ, you've given Jesus, and Jesus has given me life. And I have hope now. Thank you for the gospel. And then you start to move in to you know, that, that perspective, I think, of confession. And by the time you actually get to requests, it's amazing. I don't have time to pray anymore. I, I, I have spent the majority of the time just praising, thanking, confession, to where the requests that I thought were so important, they really aren't so much in light of who God is and the gospel that I so richly enjoy. And Paul here, in many of his prayers, he starts with thankfulness. And so what he thanks God for, look back in the text, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always offering prayer with joy in my every prayer for you all. Look at over at verse 7. For it is only right for me to feel this way about you all, because I have in my, you in my heart since both in my imprisonment and in, my, in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, you all are partakers of grace with me. For God is my witness how I long for you with all the affections of Jesus Christ. Paul, he, right from the beginning, he is thankful for the relationship they can have, but it's centered around the gospel. It's in Jesus Christ. And there is a really, really strong connection. He says, I long for these people. There is, there is a strong affection that I have. He really, really cared about this group of people. He was going to God, and he was thanking God for the relationship that he had with them, but it was based on the gospel. It was all wrapped up in Jesus Christ. They were partakers of God's grace together. When is the last time when you went to pray for your maybe one of your roommates, maybe one of your family members back home, you started the prayer with, God, I'm so thankful for this relationship because it's based in the gospel. 
Has that ever, has that ever crossed your mind? That, that we would elevate our, the content of our prayer to a gospel level because we love it so much. We love the gospel and how it has affected every area of my life and every relationship. That when I look at my relationships, it's all about the gospel. And so I run to my God on a regular basis. And Paul says he regularly prayed for these people. And he prayed and he thanked, them, thanked God for the relationship that he had. But it was based in Jesus Christ. And then he says that he is thankful because they were partners with him in the gospel. Go back to verse 5. In view of your participation in the gospel from the first day until now. Paul says, you know what? You were not just my friend. We were actually co-workers in the gospel. You worked with me as I was here. And, and, and you met my needs. And it was all based on the gospel. And so, again content of prayer. God, I thank you. I thank you for these people. I thank you that I have a relationship with them and I care about them. And it's all because of Jesus Christ. It's based in Christ. And I'm thankful that, that the relationship is so strong that we're actually partakers in the gospel together. We're partners. I'm praying for them that they would live out the gospel and they're praying for me that I would live out the gospel. And and the tone and the content of the prayer is elevated to a gospel level. Why? Because Paul loved the gospel. And then he continues on and he gives thanks to God for the work that he has done. Look at verse 6. For I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will, be per, uh, will perfect it until the day of Jesus Christ. So he as well thanks God for the gospel work in their lives. And, and he is confident that God who started the work will complete it. And so he thanks God. God, I'm so thankful for these people. I'm so thankful for the relationship that we have in Christ. I'm so thankful that they are participants in the gospel with me. And I am confident that, that you who started the work, you will complete it. Man, that, that content is a lot stronger just in the first opening line of Paul's prayer than the majority of many of the prayers that we pray on a regular basis. When's the last time any of those thoughts were actually included in your prayer for someone else? And that's not even the request yet. He hasn't, the request comes in verse 9. Let's look at the request. He says, and this I pray. So now he's, he's kind of moving to the request portion of his prayer. He says, and this I pray, that your love may abound still more and more in real knowledge and all discernment. And again, we see an elevated view of the gospel and it affects Paul's prayer life. We see that, that idea that he loved it so much and, and it came out in his thanks to God and his confidence in God's work. But then it, it transitions even into the portion of his requests in his prayer. God, I pray that they would actually live out the gospel, right? So there's the love of the gospel and there's this living out of the gospel. My prayer is that these people who I love so much that they would abound in their love more and more. And that's where he starts. Again, I ask you, when you pray for other people, does it ever include these types of thoughts? Living out the gospel. Gospel priorities. See, the gospel is not just something that, that we're saved from judgment and we have now a, a clear entrance into heaven. No, the gospel is meant to change us. There's a song that says just that. The gospel changes everything. And I've been meditating on it since I was reminded of it on Sunday. The gospel changes everything and it's changing me. That's the end of the, the course there. And so that should affect our prayer life. And Paul is confident that if he runs to the Father who cares, who is able to work on behalf of these people, 
he asks that they would live out the gospel and his simple request is that their love would abound more and more. Now, he doesn't characterize love for who, right? Right In the text, we don't see there whether he means love for God or love for people. But I think biblically, we can't separate the two. The two always go hand in hand. It is God that has shed His love on us, but it is God's love then that works through us. We can't necessarily separate the two. And so I think Paul is encouraging, he's asking the Lord that he would work and encourage this group of people to grow and abound in their love in such a way that they would love God more and more and that they would love those around them more and more. So the love was kind of two-sided. 1 John 4 says this, The one who does not love does not know God. For God is love. By this, the love of God was manifested in us, that God sent His only begotten Son into the world so that we might live through Him. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be a propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. There's the two concepts that are tied hand in hand. Our love for God and our love for people. You can't separate the two. The, the, the summation of God's commandments. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself. So Paul, in a very basic way, when he thinks about these people, he says, God, would you cause their love to abound more and more? Their love for you to abound more and more and their love for people to abound more and more. Those, those are simple concepts. But... but how many times does that content show up in our prayers for people? I mean, as you gather to pray for Clearwater Christian College, yes, we want everyone to do well in their schoolwork. We want everyone to have their bills provided for. We want good health. I understand all that. But what if we were constantly running to God, asking Him to inspire in his children, in this place, a love for him and a love for others. What if that was our starting point? It was the gospel. God, help this group of people to live out the gospel in such a real way. I think we have a lot of room to grow in our prayer lives. I think God desires us to go much deeper and as we go deeper into God's Word, our thoughts are elevated to a gospel level, a gospel priority level. Yes, we, we understand that God cares about the here and now and the physical well-being of all of us. He's a Father and He loves and He cares. But I think He wants even more to see His gospel worked out through our lives so that we live it more and more. And so this, this prayer request that Paul prays, a simple prayer request, God, I love these people. Thank you for your work in their life. Thank you for the relationship that we have through the gospel. Thank you that you started it. You're going to finish it. I'm confident of that. Please help them to grow in their love for you and their, grow, their love for others. Man, it's fantastic. But it wasn't just that, that they would have emotion about God, right? Right? It, it wasn't just sentimentalism that Paul is praying for here. There was a direction to their love. And, and the text goes on, if you look back there in verse 9, that your love may abound still more and more in real knowledge and all discernment. So the love is actually directional. It, it, it's pointing toward the knowledge of God. We find knowledge about Him in His Word. So, so it's, it's a love that abounds more and more, and, and it would be one that, that is described as knowledge and with all discernment. And so this, this prayer request goes even deeper. And you're like, whoa, I, 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 you lost me on point one, thanking God for... What was, what was I supposed to thank God for? Let alone these kinds of things. And I realize it's hard and it's difficult to stay disciplined in this. I understand. I get it. 
But I'm just trying to ignite in your heart a desire for the text of the Word of God. And the text instructs us what God wants us to do. And so we, we go to the text and we, we study it and we pull it apart and we meditate on it. And we try just little by little. What if you just took the next six days and those people who you pray about on a regular basis? I'm hoping you pray. I'm making a, an assumption that, that you pray. And I'm, I know there's probably a good group in here that, that love to seek the Lord. But let's just take the next six days. And what if you started your prayers for other people the way Paul does? God, I'm so thankful that you put this person in my life. I'm so thankful that they know you, and I'm so thankful that we can have a real relationship because Jesus Christ is at the center of it. And I'm so thankful that you started this work in my life and their life, and we're confident that, that you're going to complete it. But as we travel down this journey of faith on this road that is so difficult, would you help us to, would you just help our, our love to grow more and more? Our, our love to grow uh, in the knowledge of who you are? And our, and our love to grow in the way that we just love others and, and we live out the gospel in front of them. What if we did that for the next six days? And then you add to that another six days. And then pretty soon you start to develop a pattern of thinking about prayer. Where it's, it's more than just the physical well-being, but it's actually filled with gospel priorities that kind of elevate our thoughts and then as you seek your God and you pray to Him on a regular basis, you watch God do really, really neat things in people's life. And you see signs of grace show up because God is working. He's working in your life. He's working in the person who you're speaking about and praying for. God, would you just help our love for you to grow more and more. But it must be based in the knowledge of God and it must be then when you take that knowledge, it flows out in discernment and wanting to understand. So as we think about prayer, I know that we could have gone all kinds of different directions. But I first want to just challenge you on the idea of you better be praying. I better be praying. We're waiting for the Lord's return. We just sang about the glorious day. While we wait, we better pray. He's told us to do that. And He cares about everything in our lives. But He cares most of all of how the Gospel has affected our lives. Our spiritual walk with Him how we are in relationship to Him. Because many times He's bringing those trials into our lives to make us more like His Son. And we're praying that God would take those trials out of our lives when God is leaving them right in our lives so that we would run to Him. And so we could actually be praying against God's actual will for our lives. He means all of those things for our good and they're all for His glory. So what if we elevated our thoughts and our prayers to that, that gospel level where we prayed things like this and you go all throughout the epistles and you find examples of prayers that contain gospel priorities. God, would you fill those people up with the knowledge of your will? Another simple prayer request. Would you fill your people with the knowledge of your will? You're going to take time, Lord willing, if you stick around, which I would encourage you to do so, to pray for the persecuted church. I would think as we gathered, potentially gathered for that, you've already done that, I think, for a portion today, but perhaps our first thought goes to, let's pray for their physical well-being. Let's pray that they would be safe. And you know what? I think that's fine to pray for. But God's in control of all that. What if we, the first thing that came to our mind was in the midst of their persecution, God, would you cause 
their love to abound more and more? Would they be so anchored to the knowledge of who you are that even though they are being persecuted day in and day out, they are still standing strong in their faith and their love for you is abounding and the Gospel that they love and that they live, it's just flowing out to even those who are persecuting them. What if that's how we prayed for the persecuted church? That's how Paul prayed for the persecuted church. This church was experiencing difficulties and hardships. And, and yes, Paul wanted them to be safe and he wanted them to be cared for and provided for. All of those things are good. But notice where he starts his prayer for them. It's on a Gospel level. And that's because Paul loved the Gospel and he knew these people would love the Gospel. They were partners in it. And so that was the content of his prayer. And so many times when we go to places of prayer, whether it's here on campus, local churches, why not elevate the conversation to gospel priority praying? Why not be the first one to say, you know what? I'm struggling in my life. I'm struggling to live out the gospel. My love for God is, is, is really really weighing right now? Would you just pray for me that I, would, that I would love the Gospel and I would live it? When people do that in our prayer meetings in our church, it totally changes the atmosphere. When people get honest and, and they get to that I am level, like this is who I am before God and I really am desperate for prayer and in need, it changes the whole tone of our prayer meetings. Because it's, it's elevated to a, to a higher level. And yes, we pray for all of the physical needs, the provision of the job. We pray for all of those things. But as a pastor, I'm trying to regularly call us to go deeper. And as we go deeper, our thoughts about the gospel and our prayer, uh, the content of our prayers about the gospel, they go higher. And so... If you have a desire to pray, if God is, is continuing a desire, maybe He started years ago in your life, maybe just recently you, you've really come to grips with the fact that you need to have a regular conversation with God, you need to walk with Him, can I just encourage you to run to the Word of God to find out how to do that? And let the Scripture instruct you so that you can grow in this aspect of prayer. And I would encourage you, start with Paul's prayers. And just take maybe in your quiet time, just work through those little by little. And start breaking apart little requests that you can remember. God, I pray for my parents and, and, and I pray that their love for you would, would abound more and more today. And their love for each other would abound more and more and their love for their church would abound more and more. And, and they would be, be, be so anchored to your word that they would understand discernment and, and what is best in making wise choices. What if that's how you prayed for your parents? Or whoever it may be. God wants us to pray. While we wait, we must pray. We must remain faithful. And so why not? Why not dig deep into the Word of God and allow God's Word to elevate the content of our prayers? And I would say the Gospel's got to be the focus. And as we love it more and more, we pray that God would help us live it more and more. And then the outflow is that we would proclaim it. Right? That's the natural progression. If we're loving it, we're praying, and God's working, and we're actually living it, then it's going to flow out of us. We will proclaim it. It's who we are. It's what we live. It encapsulizes everything. Would you just bow and close your eyes as we conclude our time? We all respond to the Word of God when it's given. Whether we read it or we hear it proclaimed, we all respond. 
We don't always respond in a way that honors God and His Word. And so we're all choosing today to respond in one way or the other. And I would encourage you to respond to the Word of God in a way that glorifies Him and His Word. That you would say, God, I see Your words. I see Your text. I see Your truth. And I want to respond appropriately and I want Your truth to actually produce change in my life. So Lord, help me. Help me to live out this truth. Help me to go from here, not just enjoying prayer and access to You on this day, this set-aside day for prayer, but may, may I go from this place and actually strive to have a regular, ongoing conversation with You. Please respond appropriately. Lord God, thank You for Your truth. Thank You that it reveals the Gospel to us. Thank You for Your sovereign work that opens our eyes to understand it. Thank You that it instructs us on how we should live out the Gospel. Lord, I pray that we would regularly be seeking You. We'd be a people that when You return, whether it's in our lifetime or another generation, but when You return, you would find faithfulness. People who regularly come to You, we persistently seek Your face. And Lord, I pray that we would not only just bring our requests that involve the physical aspects of our lives, which You care for and I'm thankful, but we would actually be so concerned about how we are living out the Gospel that we would run to You and ask You for help along those lines as well. Lord, please help us to dig deep into Your Word so that You can elevate our thoughts and the Gospel priorities that You so much care about. Lord, thank You for each one of these students. I know You have a, a wonderful plan for each one of them. You love them. You care for them. You desire to walk with them. And so, Lord, would You please work for Your glory in their lives, I pray. In Your name. Okay, just before you go, let me uh, say that this really ends what we've laid out as the requirements for the day. You know, this chapel period will basically end, in a sense, the required part of the day. But yet, I want to call you to prayer. And we have a number of sessions from this point on that will be taking place in Dombach 101. And we begin there at 2.15 with a video, My House Shall Be Called a House of Prayer. And then at 3 o'clock, we'll be praying for the college. And then at 3.30, be praying for the persecuted church. It's a great day for us, a great opportunity. And I want to again remind you that the story of Clearwater Christian College that I want to invite you into so that you can help it grow and expand is a story of a college that was founded by people who love Christ, love the gospel, and who prayed. And they saw him do, they saw the Lord God do some pretty amazing things in the history of the college. And so I'm really appealing to you as a college family to give yourself to prayer in the few hours that remain in this day. And I know that perhaps some of you have uh, uh, athletic opportunities or responsibilities, you've got to practice or whatever. And I would say I'd like to call on the captains of each of those teams. You know, would you lead your teams in prayer? And I'd like to call on the faculty uh, tomorrow you resume classes, and can you take what we learned today in terms of elevating the conversation and focusing on the gospel in 
in your classroom as you lead those sessions and you, and you model before the students this, this kind of prayer emphasis. So I'm, I'm actually calling the leaders of the campus to say, would you, would you take, take some leadership? Would you stand up? Would you lead? Would you, would you pray? Would you give yourself to this kind of commitment to the God of heaven and earth? And who knows what could happen at Clearwater Christian College when we humble ourselves and we cry out to God, Lord, this is way bigger than any one of us, and we're looking to you to do some glorious things in our midst so that you'll be glorified. We'll give you the praise for all that will take place. So a couple of sessions that remain during the day over in Dombach 101, and I really invite you to consider joining us for those times. And otherwise, I trust that you'll invest your day as, as wisely and as appropriately as you can. So you are dismissed. Thank you for this, this day.